Hi, my name is Anders Bäckerman, and I will present the talk Video of Corona Lockdown Using Exax How to Create Animations from Large Datasets by me, Carl Drugge, and Sofia Herbey. We'll start with the video. The maps to the left and right show Manhattan and the surrounding boroughs. The green overlay represents the amount of taxi drop-offs at each location. A more solid green color indicates more taxis. To the right, we see the date and the time of day. The orange number shows how much less traffic there is in March 2020 compared to 2019. The blue digits show the number of confirmed COVID-19 cases in New York City. We see a distinct periodic pulsing pattern due to the higher amount of traffic during daytime and less at night. We can also clearly see the two airports, LaGuardia and JFK, whose patterns seem to be one or two hours ahead of Manhattan's. This is a high resolution video and to see it in all its details, you can find it on YouTube using the provided link. The video we just saw is computed using millions of data rows and it visualizes more than 500 dimensions simultaneously. Yet it is easy to understand. In this presentation, we will show how the animation was created so that you can create similar videos on your own. We have also made all the source code available on GitHub and we will provide a link to it later. The main tool is XX which we use for data handling, process automation, and parallel processing. To keep things simple, we use the standard Python image library for graphics rendering. There are more advanced ways to produce nice looking graphics faster, but we do not want to put a requirement on any special competence. XX, or the accelerator as we call it, is a tool for parallel and reproducible computing using Python. It is intended to be used when you want fast and organized processing. It is fast. It can process datasets composed of hundreds of billions of rows on a single computer. And it is straightforward to design parallel workflows in Python that makes use of all available CPU cores. It is organized because it remembers all jobs being computed, as well as all dependencies. Jobs are automatically reused if possible, instead of being recomputed. This saves time and resources. There is always a clear connection between input data and output results. This feature makes the workflow transparent and reproducible. And since the workflow is also automated by default, you can take your project code directly into production. And since it is fast, you only need one computer to do that. A brief history of XX. The work started in 2012 at Swedish AI startup ExpertMaker. In 2016, ExpertMaker was acquired by eBay. And in 2018, it was announced open source on the eBay tech blog. It has been used in many projects, for example with companies such as Safeway, Vodafone, Telia, eBay, Mindified, Combined Control Systems, and several others. The dataset we have selected for this demo is the Open New York City Yellow Cab dataset. This dataset contains all taxi trips from 2009 up till now. In total, there are almost 400 million rows occupying more than 200 gigabytes of disk space. There is one file per month and one row per taxi trip. Starting in 2016, locations are specified using a set of zones and we use these zones to highlight where a taxi trip occurred on a map. COVID-19 confirmed cases data is also available from the New York City Open Data resource. I should mention 
that today the taxi data set comes with a disclaimer saying that the data may be incomplete for COVID-19 related reasons. The setup for our demo is like this. We want to compare this year to previous year, 2020 to 2019. We count and highlight taxi drop-offs per zone and we want the video to run smoothly at 60 frames per second in high resolution. If we plot the data for every second, the video would be very long, so instead we decided to aggregate the data into bins, each corresponding to 10 minutes of data. This aggregation causes the video to be a little more than a minute per month of input data, but it also implies that we need to render more than 4,000 still images per month of data. So that was the setup. What will Exax bring to the project? It will provide a transparent and reproducible workflow from input data to results. Later we will show how important and useful that is. It provides parallel processing so that we can use all CPU cores of our machine. It provides streaming processing, meaning that we can stream the data through the CPUs without ever needing to load all of it into memory. Using streaming, there is no limit to the size of the input data set or the output video length. Stream processing is also very fast. We can process millions of lines per second in Python, sometimes even billions. Here's the simple data processing flow we are using. We start with input data to the left and end with in video file output to the right. Step by step we do importing of the data into XX internal format, aggregation of millions of rows of data into thousands of 10 minute bins, a smoothing moving average calculation on all bins, rendering of all the movie frames one frame per bin of data and combining of all frames into a movie file. There are two main challenges. The first challenge is that we have to read and aggregate millions of rows of data. The second challenge is that we have to render thousands of frames. In both cases, fast data access and parallel processing capabilities are key for high performance. And in addition to these points, we want the processing flow to be automated and reproducible. The first step is to transform the input data into a more efficient format. For this, we use a built-in function called CSV import that reads data stored in a tabular format. This function provides a lot of flexibility when it comes to new lines, column separate separators, and quotes. The function creates what is called an accelerated dataset that is stored on disk. This is a powerful storage format designed for fast parallel reading and writing of large amount of data, and we will talk more about it later. Step two, data aggregation. In the aggregation step, we create a new column containing a quantized version of the existing timestamp column. The quantized timestamp column will have a resolution of 10 minutes. Then we stream all the data through a program that creates a dictionary from quantized timestamps to count of taxi trips per zone. Each item in the dictionary corresponds to one still frame of the animation and the aggregation is several orders of magnitude smaller than the original input data. Finally, we apply a smoothing time domain filter to the data to make the animation more pleasant to look at. Step three, still image rendering. Using the dictionary created in the previous step, we just read one item at a time 
and draw a frame corresponding to the item's contents. We can do this completely in parallel, rendering one frame per CPU core. As mentioned earlier, we rely on the Python image library. Zone polygon definitions matching the dataset are also available from the New York City Open Data site. And we fetch the background map from OpenStreetMap. Finally, when we have rendered all the frames, we send them in order to the popular FFmpeg tool that converts the images to a single H.264 or MPEG4 video file. And that concludes the example overview. We have outlined the key steps for movie generation, and you can find all source code together with instructions how to download all required datasets by following the link on this page. I'm going to use the remaining time to talk about why XX is fast, how it helps organizing the processing flow, and what we mean by transparency. I will also show how to inspect any part of the processing flow using a web browser, as well as present some interesting technical details, such as how to carry out parallel processing without time-consuming data dependency bottlenecks. In Accelerator Lingo, a job is the fundamental unit of processing. Jobs are issued or built by build script, and a project is composed of one or more build scripts. It is clear that the script may be used to automate a process, but using the accelerator, it does not stop there. The accelerator's build scripts and jobs will together ensure complete transparency and reproducibility of the whole project. In the next slides, we will show how it works. We start with accelerator jobs. A job corresponds to some code being run. Each program that has been run by the accelerator generates a directory on disk that contains everything that was needed to run the program, that is source code, input parameters, links to input data, and so on. It also contains everything created by the running program, such as output files, return value, anything output to standard out and standard error. Since everything associated with our program run is stored in the same directory, we can directly connect a program's output with its input, parameters, and source code. Another way to put this is to say that if you know what your program you have run, and you do, then you also know where to look for the program's output. An interesting consequence is that there are no explicit intermediate files in an accelerator project. All project files reside inside jobs, and you ask for them by asking for the program creating them. This is an excellent way to store and retrieve, for example, the many results from a machine learning model meta parameter search, since source code parameters and results will be stored together in one location and can be retrieved by asking for exactly those things. There is no manual bookkeeping needed, needed and there is no risk that results from different experiments will get messed up. More about jobs. Jobs may be reused, and they are either built or linked. Let's look at the four bullets to the left of this slide. In point one, we run a program for the first time. A job directory is created containing source code and the program's output data and files. The accelerator returns a link to the created job directory back to the user. In point two, we run the same program again. The accelerator responds by immediately returning a link to the already existing job directory. This is super fast, since no computations needs to be done. In point three, we modify the program a bit and run it again. Since this modification has not been seen before, the code is executed by the accelerator 
and a new job directory is created. Now there are two job directories on disk, corresponding to the two different versions of the source code. Thus, we have information and results for both runs ready on disk. Finally, in point 4, we undo our modification and run the program again. Since the program now looks exactly like it did from the beginning, the accelerator will immediately return a link to the first job directory without recomputing anything. To summarize, if a computation has been carried out in the past, its job can be reused and the computation does not have to be carried out again. In either case, the accelerator will always return a link to the state corresponding to the current source code. The accelerator never recomputes anything that has been computed before. This saves resources and execution time. One great advantage in our experience is that this significantly reduces project development time. Jobs are built using so-called build scripts, and here we show a slightly simplified example of a build script. Each build call returns a Python object with a set of methods, methods useful for extracting information and data from the job. We can see that typically each build call inputs the return job object from the previous build, so that the next job can use results computed by the previous jobs. The process is automated, and there are no intermediate files to be seen anywhere, since all resulting files are stored inside job directories. There is no need for explicit file naming, since each output file is associated with the job that created it. The process is automated by the build script. The script's output will always correspond to the state of the source code. Modify the source back and forth and the results will change accordingly. Since all intermediate data is stored in jobs, there is no risk that any temporary files stored somewhere in the file system may be read or used by mistake and corrupt the result. All results are ensured to be reproducible. Now, let's talk about the accelerated dataset. A key reason for the accelerator's high performance is the dataset, which is designed for high-speed parallel data access. The dataset is a structure built on top of the job data structure, making use of the parallel processing and data storage capabilities of jobs. Datasets provide a parallel streaming interface to Python, and they can be expanded trivially in both number of rows and columns simply by linking datasets to each other, either one after the other, or one adjacent to the other. We've been using datasets close to 100 billion rows in projects running on a single computer without any difficulties. For parallel processing reasons, datasets store data in disjoint slices. Typically, we use one slice per CPU core on the machine. As we will see shortly, this is an efficient way to make use of the full potential of a computer's CPUs. In the picture is a schematic view of a dataset on disk, where each rectangle corresponds to one file. There is one file per column and per slice. The main idea is that we can read all slices in parallel, and we only read files corresponding to those columns needed for the task at hand. Together with file compression, this minimizes the I.O. bandwidth bottleneck to and from disk. Furthermore, datasets are strictly typed, and there are a lot of types available, ranging from various number formats to Unicode, DateTimes, and JSON. There is also a Python pickle type, which makes it possible to store any pickleable data in a dataset column. The pickle type can, for example, store things like 
dictionaries of lists of Unicode strings, TensorFlow embeddings, or Python image library images. In addition, a dataset can also store binary data, such as audio samples, JPEG images, or PDF files. The dataset is a very powerful storage structure indeed. In the video example, we added a quantized timestamp column to an existing dataset. This is a good example of how to efficiently do parallel processing using the accelerators datasets. So, here is how to append a new timestamp column, which data is a function of the existing one. We read only the timestamp column, row by row, in a streamed fashion, quantize its values, and write back into a new column that gets associated with the input dataset. This operation can be carried out on all slices in parallel to take advantage of all CPU cores to speed it up. An example code is shown at the bottom of this slide. Basically, it's a for loop over the dataset iterator, retrieving one row at a time. In this particular example, we both read and write to a dataset, since we are appending data to it. Often, we just read from a dataset when performing data analysis. A classic problem preventing naive parallel processing is that of data locality. Parallel processing works best if we can process independent data in each parallel process. To see why, consider the trivial example of counting the number of appearances of each timestamp in a dataset. A parallel solution would do counting independently in each slice. Now, if the data is distributed randomly over the slices, each timestamp may appear in several slices, and it is therefore counted by more than one process. Each process thus only computes a partial result that needs to be merged with all other partial results to get the final answer. This is typically what happens in MapReduce, for example. Merging can easily become a bottleneck. Both processing time and memory is wasted, and this may efficiently void the parallel processing effort entirely. But it does not have to be this way. There is a simple fix that runs in the linear time. We can use a hash function to reorder the data between slices so that data becomes local per slice. In short, we read the whole dataset row by row and write it to a new dataset. For each row, we make a decision in which slice to store it based on the row's data. The decision is based on a hash function applied to one of the columns. In this case, we partition the data based on the timestamp column, so that after partitioning, each specific timestamp will exist in only one slice. The actual partitioning is carried out by a built-in function, and the function call would look like what is shown at the bottom here, although slightly simplified for clarity. When the data is hash partitioned so that each timestamp exists in only one slice, it is straightforward to do processing in parallel. For example, the code shown here creates a dictionary of counters for each timestamp it counts the number of occurrences of each taxi zone. This analysis function is run in parallel on all slices. All parallel functions calls produce complete and independent results. No merging afterwards is required. This is because of the hash partitioning that ensures that each timestamp appears only in one slice. There is no merging bottleneck. Furthermore, the hash partitioning is performed in a job that is executed only once, but the created hash partition dataset may be reused many times.
transparency. By transparency we mean the ability to visualize, check and validate each and every part of a project's processing flow. Due to the nature of build scripts and job directories, there are always clear connections between all parts of a project. To simplify visualization and navigation of the processing flow, the Accelerator runs a web server called Board that can be accessed using a standard web browser. The Accelerator Board can be used to inspect jobs, datasets, dependencies, source code, results, any printed output text, and so on. It will render images, plots, movies, and display text and source code directly in the browser, making it user-friendly. Using Board, it is straightforward to follow the processing from final result all the way back to the input data, as well as displaying any source code or parameters associated with the process. Finally, we present some performance numbers. The table here shows execution times in seconds for the key processing steps. We have profiled this on three computers. A 2018 high-end laptop with four cores, a decade-old inexpensive workstation with 12 cores, and an in-between rack server with 60 cores and a terabyte of RAM. Clearly, aggregating the large dataset into items ready for rendering is a very fast operation. We could aggregate a billion lines in less than half an hour. Probably faster if we spend time optimizing the code for performance, which we have not done. Rendering, on the other hand, is relatively slow. This is because we use completely unoptimized Python image library code. It is possible to do graphic rendering much, much faster, for example, using a GPU. On the rack server, though, rendering runs at 560 frames per second, which is about nine times faster than the playback speed. And finally, as promised, here is a link to all the source code used for the project. We've also added a link to the video on YouTube, so you can see it in more detail. And we've added links to xax.org, which is where news and posts about the Accelerator are published. We link to the Accelerator example project GitHub page, the Accelerator's main repository at eBay's GitHub account, the Accelerator at PyPI, and some articles from companies using the accelerator. Thank you for listening.